We live in a world that is becoming increasingly fragmented and fractured. We see all over the world. We see it uh, everywhere from certainly Europe, which has been in the news, the Middle East. Uh, we see it in Africa. We see it in the Caribbean and Haiti. Uh, we see, uh, you know, various nations, uh, Zaire, uh, Kenya, in, in uh, Africa that have been in the news most recently, but certainly many other places all over the world. Uh, we see uh, an increasing fracturing and fragmentation. And it is always, I think, a matter that I have noticed over the years that there seems to be a correlation between the tactics that Satan uses uh, in, in every way. You know, he, he uh, seems like that the tactics that Satan seeks to use and desires to use against God's people and against God's church uh, also parallel the same kind of tactics he's using in the world at large. One of the things that we see that is so characteristic of, of our point in time right now as we uh, go into the 90s, as we're in this uh, uh, this final, this uh, tenth decade uh, of the uh, of the 20th century, this final and 10th decade of this 20th century, we see this increasing fragmentation that is taking place worldwide. And that, of course, ties in with one of the very things that Jesus Christ warned his church about uh, at the end time. In uh, Matthew 24, when he warned about a spirit of distrust, a spirit of offense, uh, a spirit of fragmentation and fracturing uh, that would ultimately result in what Jesus described in Matthew 24, 10, as then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Now, brethren, when he's talking about one another, he is talking about his followers. He's talking about his church. And he talks about and he prophesies about a time when many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall arise and, and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, because lawlessness is going to multiply, the love of many shall wax cold. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, we need to understand that Satan the devil seeks to sow the same seeds of distrust and discord and fragmentation in God's church and among God's people as he seeks to sow in the world at large. We have seen it in the world. We have seen over a, frankly, over the last 20 years in God's church, we have seen various ones. Uh, sort of go out, and many of whom have sought to take away a little group after themselves, and we've seen uh, a uh, fragmenting effect that uh, while on a proportionate basis, percentage basis, uh, any one of these has only been a tiny little fraction, uh, yet when it's taken all together, and it's taken, include in the number of people who just simply became discouraged uh, at this sort of thing, it is apparent that it has certainly taken its toll. Now, I would like for us today to understand a fundamental principle that's necessary to maintain and build unity in God's church. Because if we think that that's not going to be a matter of concern in the months and years ahead, then I think we hit ourselves. It is important for us to understand that there are warnings in the Bible, they're there for a reason. God doesn't just take up space, he doesn't just put in filler material. If he gives an example, if he gives an illustration, if he gives a warning, it's there for our good, for our benefit. And it's important that we should appreciate and value these things. It's important that we should take them seriously. If we are where we think we are in terms of biblical prophecy and as we look around the world and see the events that are transpiring and the, uh, the 
prophesied events that are shaping up on the world scene, if we are where we are in terms of prophecy as far as the world is concerned, then we also find ourselves in the end times as far as the church is concerned. You know, events in the church in terms of, of the things that are prophesied for the church are certainly going to keep pace with the things that are prophesied for the world uh, in general. Now, Christ talked about the fact that uh, people would be offended, would betray and hate one another. He talked about in verse 12, because iniquity would abound, the love of many would wax cold. We live in an iniquitous world, a world that iniquity is simply lawlessness. It is a, it is a disregard for law. We live in a world that's very selfish, that's very self-oriented, a world that does not take seriously right and wrong. You know, when we live in a world that is so upside down, we live in a world that is so upside down that in our nation, you know, we've literally come to the point, and the founding fathers would, would just uh, shake their heads in amazement, We've come to the point in this country uh, where it's illegal to pass out Bibles in a school, uh, but it's certainly all right for the students uh, uh, to get condoms at uh, taxpayer expense without their parents' knowledge or permission. Now, what does that say about standards in terms of any concept of right and wrong? It, it says that we have become so mixed up and so distorted in our any in our ability. Uh, it's what it talks about in Romans where God says, I will give them over to a reprobate mind, a mind devoid of judgment. Anybody that, that can't figure that out, anybody to whom that's a great perplexity, uh, that uh, they can't figure out, you know, which ought to be done or if both or none or, or whatever, that they, they can't figure that out, uh, there, there's a problem. Iniquity abounds in the society around us. We are the product of our society. We are influenced by the society, by the time, the culture, the society in which we live. We live in a society that takes sin less and less seriously. In, 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 any, in, in any area. In any area. And you look at how rapidly it has changed. Uh, just take Louisiana, for instance. You know, the, the three leading candidates for governor in this state are all... Uh, men who are divorced, uh, you realize that it hasn't been that long ago, back in 1964, uh, Nelson Rockefeller's divorce and remarriage cost him the California primary and therefore the Republican nomination to Barry Goldwater. His divorce and remarriage was considered a scandal uh, to the point that in California, of all places, it was still enough of a scandal that it actually cost him the primary and, and therefore the uh, Republican nomination in 1964. You go back... Uh, you, you know, uh, almost 30 years earlier than that, and, and uh, it was such a scandal in England that uh, Edward VIII was forced to abdicate his throne over the issue. Uh, we've come to a point that uh, it, it is uh, uh, that virtually anything goes. I mean, we've we've and 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 it's important to understand this has happened in such a short time. We have, of course, young people who come along that grow up in a society where, in, in their experience which may, you know, be only a matter of five or ten years in terms of their active memory of what's going on around, where they can't imagine some of these things ever having been taken that serious. And yet we live in a society that is on such a downhill toboggan slide in terms of any uh, concept of morality that, that iniquity abounds. A lawless attitude just is multiplied and the result of lawlessness is love grows cold because, you see, lawlessness equates with a lack of love because lawlessness really is a selfish, self-centered approach. It's, I don't, you know, I'm, gonna, I, I'm concerned about me, I'm going to take care of me, and I don't care about anybody else or what happens to them. So we live in a society that's that way, and in brethren, we kid ourselves if we think some of it doesn't rub off on us. And we grow careless, and we grow, we grow lax, and we uh, kind of, uh, you know, can water down here, there, and yonder, even in our standards. Because we're influenced by the society, the culture, the time, the age in which we live. Well, Christ gives us some warnings, and they're warnings that we need to take seriously. And let's, let's look, let's understand a little bit. 
To begin with, what's the source of our unity and our fellowship in God's church? What is the source of the unity and the fellowship that we have? We find it back in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 2. The life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you the that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. Now John is talking about Jesus Christ. And his life was manifested. John says, we've seen it. You know, he was there. He says, I've seen it. I'm bearing witness and I'm going to show you the the eternal life that was with the Father. In other words, Christ was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. So John was talking not about second-hand information, but about that which he had experienced. He said, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. So John, in writing to the church, says, I'm explaining things to you so that you may have fellowship with us, so that you may share with us and be partakers with us, that we may have something in common. Because the words partakers, the words for the, the expression uh, in common, or communion, or fellowship, or partakers. All these words come from the uh, uh, the same word in the Greek language. And uh, uh, it, it has to do with a sharing. Our word communication, the word communion, uh, the word common, all of those words share a, a root word. They, they go back uh, to the same root word. What it has to do with is, is having something in common, sharing something, being partakers of something, our fellowship. So, what is the basis of, of what we share among and between ourselves? What is the basis of what we have in common? Well, John says, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And he says, don't kid yourself. You can't have fellowship with God and live your life walking in the darkness of this world. See, the Scripture tells us it, it compares the world under the influence of Satan to lying in darkness. Because the world doesn't see. And the world is enshrouded in spiritual darkness. It lacks uh, perception. It lacks uh, insight and, and just being able to, to grasp uh, what's going on. And the world is darkened by sin and sin's influences. God is not. See, God is light. In Him is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie. We're kidding ourselves. You see, you can't live like the world and have fellowship with God at the same time. We can't run with the devil and walk with God simultaneously. It simply doesn't work that way. So John is bringing that out. He said, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we haven't sinned, we make him a liar, and his truth is his word is in So John is not talking about the fact that uh, if you're in the church, you never sin. You never slip up. He says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Truth is in You're kidding yourself. If you say, oh, well, you know, I, I've certainly been perfect ever since I've been in the church. No. But there is a difference. There is a difference between a slip and a way of life that is practiced. See, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The basis of our fellowship with one another is that we are walking with God. And if we're walking with God, we're walking in the light. See, what does it tell us in the the 119th Psalm? God's law is a light 
It's a light to our feet, a lamp to our path. God's law, which emanates out from God, lightens our path. And the path that it lightens is that straight and narrow way that Jesus talked about, and he said, few there be that find it. That broad and wide way, many that do, many there be that go in there at, that broad and wide way that leads to destruction, that is the way that is lying and crowded in darkness. You can't walk that way and walk in the light at the same time. God's law is the, is the means by which we can, by which it illuminates that, that pathway. The basis of our fellowship with one another, John says right here in 1 John 1, the basis of our fellowship with one another is that we have fellowship with God and with Christ. We have fellowship with God and with Christ when we walk as they walk. You see, it, it's important to understand, sometimes we hear the, the expression, sometimes we, we use the expression in the church, uh, we refer to an individual as being disfellowship. Now, what does that mean? Well, it just simply means that they're no longer a part of the fellowship of, uh, uh, of God's people, of God's church. They're no longer included in the fellowship of God's church. It goes right back, if you want to understand it, right here in 1 John 1. The only basis we have for fellowship together is that we are walking in the light of God's way. The basis of our fellowship with one another is that we are walking in fellowship with God and with Christ. If we cease to walk in the light and we're walking in darkness, then we no longer have a basis for fellowship with one another. The church, by its very meaning, the very existence and meaning of the term church, a church means uh, called out ones. It means assembly or group. The church of God is God's assembly, God's group, those that God has called out. So, the basis for fellowship in the church is not just uh, some sort of casual approach. That you can't have it both ways. That's why Paul uh, made plain, and we could go through scriptures, the perfect sermon is not to go into this fellowship, uh, but it is, I think, important that we understand, because, you know, we live in a society that prides itself so much on being broad-minded and being tolerant. I'm going to tell you, if, if you get to a point where you're more broad-minded and you're more tolerant than God, you're in trouble, because you're wrong, plainly and simply. You know, if God seems narrow-minded to you, who's right and who's wrong, you or God? Does God need to kind of change with the times and keep up with the 20th century? You know, is God kind of an old fogey? God needs to sort of broaden his horizons? Well, don't ever kid yourself into thinking that. You know, when, when you become more broad-minded and more tolerant than God, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because you're wrong. God is right. And we're only right to the extent we agree with God. It doesn't matter if every single one of us in this room agree on something, that does not make it either right or wrong. Every single one of us, me, all of you, we can all agree on something. But that will not make it right or wrong. The only agreement that makes it right or wrong is whether or not we agree with God. The issue is not do we agree with one another. The issue is do we agree with God. That's, that's where we have to look in terms of our agreement. Now, we're going to see a little more about agreement later on, but here we're dealing in John, 1 John 1, we're dealing with a basic way of life. A way of living, a way of walking through life. Life in this sense is pictured as a journey. And you are walking on this journey. And we walk on this journey through life. We're either walking in the light of God's law or we're walking in the darkness that enshrouds the world. And we're practicing the works of the flesh. If we're living the ways of the world, if we're fitting in and blending in with the world, then we're walking in darkness. And eventually we get far enough off the path that we don't have a basis for continued fellowship with God. When, when someone's conduct is blatantly out of step with God, 
then we have to inform that individual, look, what you're doing is not in fellowship with God. You can't live that way and walk with God. And if you're not going to walk with God, then you no longer have a basis for fellowship with God's people. Now, when you want to walk with God, then you have the same basis for fellowship with God's people that all the rest of us have. But you can't live and be practicing as your way of life the world's way. And kid yourself that you're in harmony with God at the same time won't work. Well, we could go on through. You see, it's, it, it is a matter. If we, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. You know, you slip off the path a little bit. There is a way to get back on. God's not standing there just ready to get you. God's not hoping your foot will slip so He can shove you on down the precipice and say, well, we're through with you. You see, if we face it, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to clean us up. Chapter 2 goes on. He says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth not any. Whosoever, whoso keeps his word in him truly is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we're in him. He that says he abides in him all, himself also to walk even as he walks. You see, if we're going to abide in Christ, if we're going to abide in Christ, if we're going to have fellowship with God, if we're going to abide in God's love, then we're going to have to, as our way of life, seek to practice Christ's instructions, seek to practice God's commandments. Let's go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 1 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your own lust, with war in your members you lust and have not? You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You walk, you fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. You can't be in harmony with this world and with God at the same time. If you fit in with the world, you don't fit in with God. Plain and simple. And that's, that's an issue that I think every one of us in God's church has to face. Whose approval is most important? The world's approval or God's approval? Because brethren, make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. You can't have both indefinitely. Oh, there may be some things that God tells you to do that the world will approve of. But ultimately, you cannot keep and maintain the world's approval and God's approval. You simply cannot have both. Friendship with the world, whosoever will be the friend of the world, is the enemy of God. So we have to consider, Abraham was called the friend of God. Abraham was called the friend of God. Abraham kept his distance from the world. Lot didn't. Lot did. I know that he was just Lot, but he was just barely just Lot. And uh, he wound up losing everything that, nearly everything that was important to him, lost virtually his whole family. Because Lot followed a way of compromise. He didn't go all the way and become a part of the world doing everything that the society around him was doing, but he got too close to it. And he compromised on little things until the point that it finally... Uh, destroyed his family. Because you see, they went further than he did. And they got more deeply enmeshed than he did. And he, he failed in terms of his proper exercise of leadership. And he let his family get too enmeshed in that world because he got too enmeshed in it. And it uh, cost him a tremendous amount. Abraham's called friend of God. You can't be friend of God and, and, and friend of the world at the same time. And that's important for us to understand because uh, when we, we start trying to see how far we can go to accommodate the world, we get on a very slippery slope. 
that can take us right down into the cesspool if we're not very careful. Do you think, verse 5, the Scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? But he gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. So if we're, if we're wanting to get close to God, what do you do? Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, surrender to him unconditionally. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. In other words, clean up what you do. Change your action. And that's not the stopping place. That's simply part of the starting place. Purify your hearts. You double-minded. You pulled in two different directions. You're going to have to purify your hearts. You know, before you can purify your hearts, you have to really examine what's in your heart. One of the greatest dangers is we kid ourselves about why we do what we do. It's easy to kid ourselves about why we do what we do. You see, we, we a lot of times we do something to fit in, to blend in. We do it, but we really don't want to examine and to look at all the reasons. We hate to admit to ourselves what some of the reasons are. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Deep repentance. Humble yourselves in the sight of God. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. So there is a way to fellowship with God. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66, verse 1, Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you build for me? Where is the place of my rest? All those things as, uh, has my hand made. All those things have been, says the Lord, but to this man will I look. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Someone that has no sense of spiritual self-sufficiency. They recognize their lack of spiritual self-sufficiency. They recognize their spiritual poverty and therefore their need for the riches of God's grace. They have a contrite spirit, a repentant attitude, and they tremble at God's word. In other words, uh, there is a, a sense of awe, uh, there is a sense of excitement and anticipation at God's word. You, you know, you can, you can quiver with excitement. Uh, you ever seen a, uh, you know, a bird dog uh, ready to ready to go and you won't let him take off yet, you know, and he, he's out there and he's just quivering with, with excitement and anticipation. Uh, it doesn't just, just have to mean the sense of, uh, that, uh, of cowering in a corner. We ought to, to have deep awe and respect and reverence for God's Word. We ought to also be excited with anticipation of God's Word. But there is an attitude that it expresses here. The basis of fellowship with God. The basis of fellowship with God is that we agree with God, that we walk with God, that we have a humble and contrite attitude and that we tremble at His Word. We really take God's Word seriously. We really want to be like God. We want to learn what God wants us to learn. And we have an attitude of humility. An attitude of repentance. An attitude of recognizing how great God is and how small we are by comparison. How much God has and how much we need what He has. So, fellowship with God is the starting point. And an attitude, our attitude and approach toward God, and our attitude and approach toward God's law, toward God's Word, and that's going to carry right on down into the way we do. It kind of goes back to what we're to learn at the feast. You know why the law was read at the feast. Deuteronomy 31 tells us that it was read so that everybody might hear, so that they might learn, so that they might fear, and that they might do His commandments. So there's a progression. We, we hear it, we read it, we hear it, so that we can learn it. 
We learn it not simply to know something that other people don't know. We learn it so that it can change the way we think and feel on the inside. And that, in turn, will be reflected in what we do on the outside. All those things go together. That's that's our fellowship with God uh, at a starting point. Now, you know, fellowship with God... In, involved our whole relationship with God and it's the basis for our fellowship with one another. We have no basis for unity with one another if we have not a unity with God. If we're not in fellowship with God, then we don't have a fellowship with one another that will endure. Because if our fellowship with one another is is simply and purely based on physical things, you like somebody's personality, you come from the same uh, area that they did, or you've known them for a long time, or or, or you uh, uh, have some of the same hobbies, or you know that's great. There's nothing wrong with that, and there are going to be certain people in the church that you're going to really click with. Maybe you're about the same age, or maybe you have uh, similar interests. Uh, maybe you both like to hunt, or you both like to fish, or you uh, enjoy doing certain things, or your kids are the same age. That's great. That's fine. That's that's not a problem. But if that is the only basis of your fellowship, if that's the only thing that ties us together, then we're going to fragment and fracture because, you see, we come from a variety of different backgrounds. We have a variety of different interests and hobbies, personalities, different educational levels, different ages, different races, different uh, religious and ethnic backgrounds, all sorts of things that unless we have a unity that transcends the physical things, that transcends personality, that transcends uh, hobbies, that transcends personal interests and likes and dislikes, unless we have a unity that transcends those things, then we're simply going to fracture and fragment like the world. We're living in a world that is becoming and will become increasingly fractured and fragmented along every sort of line you can imagine. You see, the basis of our unity is going to have to derive, first and foremost, from our unity with God and with Christ. Our unity with God and with Christ is derived from an attitude of awe and respect that we have for God, an appreciation and a value that we have for God and for His Word and for His law, that we take God's Word seriously. That it's important. If we find out God says something, then we, we're planning to do it. You see, it's not that uh, you have to know every single thing. It is a matter that you have to have a surrendered attitude, heart and mind. That we are practicing the things we do know. And, uh, you know... It is. It has to do with a perspective and an approach toward life of awe and reverence and respect for God, respect for God's Word, taking God's Word, God's law, God's commandments very seriously. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us, if we're going to continue that fellowship with God, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please Him. He that comes to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek. You know, we live in an age that really... Faith sort of goes against the grain of our age. We live in an age that is so impressed with the scientific method, with what can be touched and tasted and felt and measured, what can be seen and discerned by the five physical senses, that to most people, if you can't discern it and distinguish it by the five physical senses, then it's not real. And yet, brethren, the most real things there are, the most eternal and permanent things they, there are, are the things that cannot be measured by the five and discerned by the five physical senses. See, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love it. Ultimately, without faith, it's impossible to please Him because if you don't trust God, you're not going to follow Faith needs to be at the heart and core 
of our relationship with God. We need to learn to trust God more deeply. And I think we, if many of us will look in our lives, we realize that a lot of things uh, have and can undermine the faith that we have. Because faith is a simple childlike quality. We live in a sophisticated society. We live in a society where we're so enamored and impressed of all the things that man can do. Man's technology. And we kid ourselves and we don't think some of that rubs off on us and affects us. We can get to where we become so focused on the physical, the here and the now, the technology that man has to offer, that God's promises can become very remote and very unreal. And we can get to where we, we pay lip service to it. We acknowledge it with our mouth. But in reality, it doesn't really seem that real to us. Without it, faith, it's impossible to please Him because if you don't trust Him, you're not going to follow Him. If you're going to come to God, you have to believe that He is. And that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Because if you don't believe that, you're not going to stick. If God's not real to you and His promises aren't real to you, then you have no basis to endure. God makes promises and God's promises are real. But it can seem so unreal because we live in such a sophisticated age. Such an age that is so geared to scientific measurement. But to really believe that God is real. Well, I'll tell you, it's, uh, you know, people, you, you, you explain, you tell somebody something and, and uh, uh, you, you know, they want to know, well, what, what are you doing about it? Well, I'm trusting God. Well, yeah, I understand that, but what are you doing? You see, as though trusting God isn't doing something. Because trusting God seems sort of unreal. I mean, that's fine. See, we all pay lip service to that. Yeah, well, sure, we trust God. But what are you doing? What what are you actually doing? Trusting God is doing something, brethren. Faith is active. It's not passive. Trusting God is actively doing something. Now, there may be times that there are physical things uh, that we can and should do. I'm not saying that there are never things that that we can and should do. But don't ever kid yourself that trusting God is is not really doing something. Because if you're really trusting God in the active sense, then that's doing something very, very real. And that's important to understand. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the fathers and, and mothers of the faithful were told in verse 13 of Hebrews 11, these all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They believed God and they believed God unto death. They didn't set a time limit on God. They trusted God. And they trusted God all the way to the end. Trusting God is a very real and a very important thing. It needs to be something that we seek to grow in. It's one of those fruits of God's Spirit that we have to go to God and really ask Him for. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves that we live in a world that is so geared against faith that it's so much easier for us humanly to trust in what we can see than it is to put our trust in what we can't see. So much easier to trust in a human being that we can see than the invisible God that we know by faith. It involves the way we live our lives. It involves learning to trust God in the little things and building a relationship with Him that will enable us to trust Him through the big things and through the trials that come. I think that it is a matter that we in God's church really need to take seriously and examine in our own lives. Because I think if most of us are honest with ourselves, we realize that we may not have the faith that we once did. I've heard many, many people in the church express that. And I think we have to realize we live in a world that works against faith. And our faith can be undermined. 
Our faith is not an emotion that we work up within ourselves. It is something that God can and will give us. We have to go to it. And it is part of our, of our unity and our relationship with Him. But you see, our unity and our relationship with God uh, carries on over uh, into our relationship with one another. We're, we're told, you see, that uh, uh, if we love God, then we will also love one another. And that uh, love and faith uh, and obedience to God all are, are intertwined. You can't separate. Because ultimately, faith, trust, derives from the fact that we love God and we know God loves us. Faith ultimately anchors to, to the fact that God loves us. And God is going to tell us the truth, and if God says it, He'll do it. And when God says it, I believe it, that settles it. Because God commends His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and ultimately, we have a basis for a relationship with God that God has taken the first step to bring about. Now, our relationship with God is going to reflect itself in our relationship with one another. Because if you remember, we started out in, in 1 John chapter 1 where John talked about the fact that he was writing to the congregation, he was writing to the brethren, so that their joy might be full, so that there would be a basis for them to have fellowship with Him and Him with them because they would all be in fellowship with God. The basis of our fellowship with one another goes back to our fellowship and our relationship with God. And frankly, brethren, the closer we are to God, the greater closeness and harmony that there ought to be reflected among and between us. In John chapter 13 and verse 34, Jesus said, A new commandment that I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. Now what was new was not that you love one another. What was new was the extent of that love. That as I have loved you, you love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. So love is to be a hallmark, a descriptive characteristic of the disciples of Jesus Christ, the people of God. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, we're told, Hereby perceive we the love of God. 1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Whoso has this world's good and sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. How do we understand? How do we perceive? What? How do we grasp the love of God? Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The Father gave Jesus Christ for us. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. So if you want to gain insight into how much God loves you, God loves you to the point that He gave Jesus Christ to reconcile you to Himself. Now, in this way, we are able to perceive, we're able to grasp the extent, the magnitude of the love the Father has for us. How are we able to grasp and perceive the love that we have for one another? Well, to the extent that we lay down our lives for one another. Now, that's not just some far off thing, well, yeah, you know, I'd die for you. You know, our life is our time. And the extent to which we lay down and we give up of our time, that we sacrifice our own convenience. To the extent that we do that, we, we, we demonstrate our, our love, our concern 
if we're in a position to help someone and we see that they need that help, and we just sort of turn off compassion, that's not the love of God. Love is not something that we just express. It's not something that is just a nice, sweet sentiment that we express. It ought to be reflected in deeds. It ought to be reflected in what we truly do. You see, it starts with our relationship with God and it carries on into our relationship with one another. Now, there are things that certainly we can do in terms of of uh, our fellowship with one another. Love is the basis of our relationship. Starts out, the, the real basis is our relationship with God. we need to be aware of in terms of utilizing that and being able to to build on on that relationship in our homes and our families and in our relationships with one another you know one aspect of that if we're going to to grow in our love and in our fellowship and our unity with one another then there has to be Uh, an approachableness that we have. Now, let's, if you want an extreme example, I I think the the example in the Bible of, uh, of the uh, individual that I know of, there's a place in the Bible that talks about the most unapproachable individual that, uh, that that I know of. uh, He's mentioned in the Bible. He sort of represents an extreme. I don't think most of us uh, represent, I don't have known anybody else that represents quite this extreme, but I've known some that maybe came fairly close to it. Uh, but there are some attitudes that this individual exists, exhibited, uh, that all of us can exhibit from time to time. Now, the individual I have reference to, uh, is a man who is known, uh, in the Bible as Ahasuerus. He's known in secular history as Xerxes. Uh, he is the husband of Queen Esther in the book of Esther. Now, I'm not going to go back there and go through the book of Esther. We, we have done that before. But I would just call your attention to the story. Uh, you remember that uh, he had uh, allowed Haman to sign a decree uh, to execute all the Jews. Mordecai, Esther's cousin, older cousin who had raised her, uh, had gone to Esther and had gotten word to her and had said, look, uh, you know, you're in a position, you are the queen you go in to the king and talk to him. And Esther said, you know, I'm afraid to do that. He's not a real approachable sort of guy. In fact, you, you know, you walk into him and he hasn't sent for you, and he may just cut your head off. Now, I've heard of people saying, well, boy, you know, he just, uh, he just, he, he was, he, he bit, he, he'll bite my head off. But they didn't mean it literally. Esther meant it literally. I mean, it was to the point that she said, look, all right, I'll go. But I'm going to fast for three days and three nights first, and you get all the Jews together in Shushan, and all of you fast with me for three days and three nights, and then I'll go into the king. Now, you know, he was so unapproachable that she had to fast three days to get up the courage to even walk into the room where he was. I would call that somewhat unapproachable. Uh, you, you know, that, that he was an unapproachable sort of fellow. Now, why was he unapproachable? Unapproachable. Well, several reasons. One of which goes back to uh, uh, the law, what was called the law of the Medes and the Persians. Now, you read that expression many times in, in the scripture. You know what the law of the Medes and the Persians was based upon? That the king was never wrong. The law of the Medes and the Persians, once the law was promulgated, it couldn't be changed because if you change it, then what you're saying is the king made a mistake. And the king never made a mistake. That's why they had trouble, see, after the decree was issued, they had to figure a way around that. 
They wound up, they, they didn't reverse, they didn't repeal the decree. They simply uh, gave a command uh, that the Jews now had the right to defend themselves uh, from those that attacked them. See, the original decree was anybody could attack the Jews that wanted to and take all their property. He couldn't repeal that because that was, the law of the Medes and the Persians was, you know, king said it, that was it. King never made a mistake. So he issued another decree and he said the Jews had the right to defend themselves uh, and the troops uh, of the Persians uh, were expected to help them. Oh, well, you know, even if you did have permission to attack them and you were going to be attacking them and the whole Persian army, uh, you might decide you didn't really want to attack them after all. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, it sort of cast a different light on it. But you, you see, what was the problem? Well, number one, here you had an individual who was never wrong, at least in his mind. He, he grew up thinking, and everybody around him, uh, he, he had this attitude, he was never wrong. Now, if you're never wrong, you're not a very approachable sort of fellow. Because nobody can ever tell you or even suggest to you uh, that you might be wrong. You might have made a mistake. He was not a very approachable fellow because, number one, he, he was never wrong. He was always right. Never made a mistake, never said, I'm sorry. He was an individual that did not was not given to self-control. Uh, you read the story, you find out that he, he uh, uh, clearly uh, had a problem in terms of alcohol, which was a rather common problem in that uh, uh, Persian, media Persian society. Uh, he certainly reflected that, was an individual that, uh, uh, you, you know, could not... Uh, really had no control in any facet or phase of his life. And uh, the whole society and culture encouraged him to, to uh, accept the fact that he couldn't be wrong because after all, uh, the law of the Medes and the Persians was, was you know, that was infallible. He, uh, there, there's really nothing about himself that he controlled, including his temper. He was never an individual who learned self-control in any area of life. And therefore, if something struck him wrong, well, uh, he, he was ready to, to just, you know, uh, boom, fly off the handle completely. That's why on a whim, he had power of life and death, and so on a whim, he could just lop somebody's head off if they struck it, if he didn't like the, uh, if he didn't like it. So, he was not an approachable fellow. Now, most people, you see, all of us have at least some constraints of society upon us. And though there are people who, who do literally shoot somebody or, or stab somebody or, or kill somebody, uh, but there are others who certainly have the attitude and yet are enough afraid of, of the punishments and penalties of society that they may put some restraint upon themselves and, and not go quite to that extreme. The point is that if you, ne if, if you have an attitude that you're never wrong, Nobody can ever tell you anything. You're, you're never wrong. Never make a mistake. Never say I'm sorry. And, and you don't control yourself. Just fly off the handle. You're going to be about, approach, about as approachable as old Xerxes. And, uh, you know, that's sort of a sad thing. I mean, this was his wife. This was his wife. There's no way that we can have a close unity and fellowship in the church if we're not approachable. We have to be approachable, and we also have to know how to approach. Well, we could also go through the story of Esther and find out some keys there, but instead let's go back to the book of Galatians. You see, one, we have to encourage being approached ourselves, which means, of course, that we have an attitude of humility, an attitude of being willing to admit wrong. You see, if we're close to God, then we're going to have an attitude of humility. We're going to have an attitude of teachableness. And Remember, it's our closeness to God that is the basis of our closeness with one another. It's going to reflect itself in love. It's going to reflect itself in our being approachable. It's also going to reflect itself in the way that we do approach one another. 
In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, one another's heavy loads, and so fulfill the law of Christ. He says, if you see a brother, you see somebody overtaken in a fault, you see somebody bogged down in a problem, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You go to somebody about a problem, go in the spirit of meekness. Don't go with an attitude of haughty superiority. Don't go with an attitude that you're better than they are. Realize that under a different set of circumstances, you could be in the same spot, in the same place. It says, you which are spiritual. Now, what does that mean? Well, you know, that's a matter of degree. Some things, what it's saying is, if you see somebody with a problem, then if you have the spiritual wherewithal to help them, then do so. If you don't, then find somebody that does. I sort of liken it to standing uh, there on a, you know, watching somebody in trouble in the water, maybe a, uh, somebody drowning, and uh, you see the person. If you're able, maybe there's a pole there, and, and you can reach that pole out and then grab a hold of it and you can pull them in. You know, that's great. Maybe they're out too far and you can't get to them. And you're not able to do it. What do you do then? Well, at that point, you know, if you see that they're in more trouble than what you can help them out of, then you, you know, you go running to find somebody. You go hunt for the lifeguard. If you're able to help, if you're in a position to help and you're able to help, you have the wherewithal to help, then, then do so. But, you know, you have to be careful not to get in over your head because sometimes, uh, uh, you know, one person can't swim, they're out there struggling around. Another person can't swim, they jump in to help them, they just both drown. Now, if you're in a position to, to reach them a pole or to go out in a boat or something of that sort, uh, that may be one thing. And if you're not, you better find somebody that is. So, that's what it means when it says you which are spiritual. Different degrees of problems require different degrees of spiritual strength and maturity to handle. There are things that sometimes, you know, any number of us uh, can, can handle uh, because we have the experience, we have the spiritual wherewithal to give help in this or that area. And eventually we find there are other things that we realize, I'm out of my depth. You need more help than what I can give you. And at that point, then we seek for that extra help. It says if you, if, if, if somebody's overtaken in a fall, you with your spirits will restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Not a putting down sort of an attitude, but an attitude of trying to help one another bear the heavy loads. An attitude of, of encouragement, an attitude of meekness. That's the way we approach. You see, we, we make ourselves approachable by an attitude of humility and being teachable. We approach in a spirit of meekness. You know, what so often happens is that we get our defenses up, somebody approaches us, and we get, we get very defensive. Of course, sometimes they don't approach in maybe the, the exact way that they should. But you see, we have to recognize our need to be approachable. Our need to be approachable, and we also have to recognize the importance of approaching one another in a right and proper manner. We're told in, in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16, Then they that feared the eternal spoke often one to another, and the eternal hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written. Before him, for them that feared the eternal and that thought upon his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, and that day when I make up my jewels, I'll spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. Then shall he return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. Here it's talking about, if you really want the time setting, talking about the time prior to Christ's return, talking about those that, of God's people that will be spared. Uh, verse 17 is certainly an allusion. Uh, you know, he says, I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. So, certainly an allusion to the fact of 
of uh, the church that will be protected in, in a place of safety uh, during the time of the tribulation, while there are others uh, who, because God does love them, are going to be allowed to learn an important lesson. Now, if you back it on up to verse 16, we find who are these that God spares? Well, they're the ones that fear God, ones that really stand in awe of Him, they're impressed with Him, and they speak often one to another, they encourage one another and bolster one another, and God takes note. God takes note. You see, it's it's a description, really, of, of the Philadelphia church. It's a description of those that really fear God, that really stand in awe of Him. They're seeking to encourage one another because brotherly love is there and trying to build one another up and to encourage one another. They spoke often one to another and the eternal hearkened and heard it. A book of remembrance was written before Him for them that feared the eternal and that thought upon His name. You know, it, again, I, and I've heard comment from, from various ones that talked to a number about it. If we're not careful, we can get to a point, and I think that we have been drifting in, in a way that a lot of times our, our discussion, our conversation becomes more and more on a superficial, uh, physical, carnal basis. And carnal just means physical, means fleshly. And that's not wrong to discuss uh, physical things. You know, how did your week go or, uh, or things of this sort. Things that it's not wrong to discuss that, but you know, if our conversation never has any spiritual depth to it, then the basis, then, then what is the basis of our fellowship, and then how does it differ from fellowship with friends and relatives that uh, uh, don't understand God's way? You see, ultimately, the basis of our Fellowship is to be a spiritual fellowship. Now that doesn't mean that they're, that, that they're not, obviously if we're, if there is a, a spiritual fellowship and there is a depth of fellowship and a depth of, of concern and of love for one another, then obviously we're interested in one another's daily lives and we're interested in, in, uh, uh, you know, someone is having a trial or having a problem on a job or they received a blessing. Well, you know, those are certainly appropriate things to talk about. We, we rejoice uh, with those that we rejoice, we mourn with those that mourn, we, we, we have empathy and compassion, and we can pray for one another in, in trials and things we're going through. So, I'm not in any way saying that it's wrong to, to share those things. Obviously, it's not. Nor is it, it wrong to make reference to uh, just other things, you know, from the weather to, to you name it. Uh, that's fine. But if that is the extent, then I think we have to back up and ask ourselves why. Because God wants His people to fellowship, to, to talk with one another, to encourage one another, to discuss, uh, you know, our discussion of the feast. Maybe you discuss, uh, you know, places you ate or, or activities you took the kids to, and that's fine. But if that's all that's ever discussed, and the sermons aren't ever discussed, then we have to step back and look at, you know, is it physical or is it spiritual? We need to strive for a deeper relationship, a relation, deeper relationship with God, a deeper relationship with one another. And... These things lie at the heart and core of, of matters that will deepen our relationship with one another, that will stand in the way of our being uh, fractured and splintered and fragmented. Now, one line of caution here, and I, I think, you know, let, let's be honest, let's, you know, let's face it for what it is that sometimes and we have experienced, I think those of us who have been in the church uh, for a, let's say, 20 years and more, uh, recognize that there was, as a result of many of the problems and the 
divisions that we began to encounter at the beginning, the very beginning of the 70s, uh, there began to be a certain uh, breakdown of, well, just openness of communication that many of us, I know I found myself uh, during certainly during a lot of that period of time, uh, even at ministerial meetings and conferences, of not really knowing to whom I could talk and 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 what I could say because uh, sort of battle lines were being drawn, and uh, there was not the the openness uh, that there had once been, and as a result, certain tensions build up and people became more and more guarded in their comments because uh, the fear that they were going to be branded uh, this way or that way, and and there was just a certain underlying tension that came in. Those things, I, I certainly uh, in time, uh, those things uh, began to improve. I, I think we, we went through some very difficult times, but I think we kid ourselves if we don't recognize that there can be and do exist from time to time certain tensions uh, that come up and certain apprehensions uh, none of us wants to uh, uh, be branded uh, in some sort of way and to have our, our conversion uh, brought into question uh, because of an opinion on this or that subject. And as a result, if, if we're not careful, our fears and apprehensions of some of these things can create barriers, can create tensions that ultimately mean that the basis of our fellowship can be come to a point where it's only existing on the most shallow and superficial level. And when that comes about, then we're ripe for Satan to incite discord and fragmentation. You know, the Roman church experienced problems along that line, uh, far more so than what we are experiencing in the church today, because the Roman church, uh, in in some ways, was not uh, even a fully organized church congregation uh, it was a group of believers that had congregated in Rome over a period of years and who were fellowshipping with one another, but there was not uh, an ordained ministry present in Rome. Uh, there were uh, there was a fellowship of believers, people primarily who had come into the church in other areas and had moved to Rome. Paul desired to go to Rome that he might establish them and give them a firmer foundation, but there were a lot of problems. Uh, there were disagreements that existed in Rome. And it was in danger, uh, it, it, there was a danger of, of actually fragmenting the congregation. Uh, there were ethnic divisions because there were people of a Greek and Latin background who had one cultural background, people of Jewish background who had a different cultural background. There were prejudices that each had toward the other. Uh, there were varying levels of depth of understanding. I don't want to get into all of that. But in Romans chapter 14, the specific issue in chapter 14 uh, primarily had to do with uh, uh, the issue of meats. And it was not a matter of clean and unclean meats. It wasn't a matter uh, of vegetarianism in the sense that it is known today. Uh, the issue had to do that uh, strictly observant Jews require meat not only to be clean, but also to be kosher. Now, there's a difference. Kosher goes beyond clean. Uh, if it's unclean, well, it's certainly not kosher, but uh, kosher includes not merely uh, the fact that it is it is of a clean animal, but that it was ritually slaughtered in the proper way, uh, in this day and time, it would certainly have included the fact that it had not been uh, offered to an idol. You know, when, when meat was sacrificed to an idol, that didn't mean they burned the whole thing on the altar. It meant that, they, that the blood was poured out uh, there on the idol's altar, that maybe some of the fat or entrails were burned on the altar, but the meat itself was utilized. In fact, uh, the temples, they, they, the, the pagan temples in Rome, uh, there were... There was a lot more meat that was brought there, animals that were sacrificed, than could possibly be consumed by the priests. And as a result, uh, one of the main sources of, uh, of supply of meat for the meat markets in Rome uh, came from the temple. Well, they, 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 what they did was they sold it uh, after the sacrifices there, because they, you know, they had gods all over Rome, and uh, you know, temples on every every place, and. Uh, 
far more meat that was coming in, sheep and goats and, they, and cattle uh, that were being sacrificed there. And so what they did was they, they went through their ritual and, and, and the meat itself, the bulk of it, was actually sold uh, through what's ta- called the shambles, the meat market. Now, you, if you went in there, you didn't know whether, you couldn't look at a leg of lamb and tell whether it came from a, a lamb that had been slaughtered down at the Temple of Jupiter Olympus or whether uh, the guy uh, had taken it out and slaughtered it behind his, his building there. You didn't know. And uh, uh, it was a great cause of concern. Uh, many of the, of the strictly practicing Jews simply would not eat meat unless they could be absolutely assured uh, that a rabbi had supervised its, its slaughter. And they knew that it had in no way been connected with idolatry or, or improper slaughtering methods. And so it became a cause of division, a cause of discord, uh, as to what constituted eating meat offered to idols. And uh, it was a source of division and discord here in Rome. In Romans 14.4, Paul says, Who are you that judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, yea, he shall hold him up, for God is able to make him stand. He comes on down in verse 7, he says, None of us lives to himself, and no man dies to himself. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. To this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you set it not your brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's written, as I live unto the Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us therefore not judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. You see, this was the basis that Paul gave for unity. It was not a matter that every single thing was going to be totally understood and agreed upon alike. You know, it's incredible what people have done over the most minor of disagreements. You know, back in the, in the 1600s in Russia... They had a, uh, a change in, uh, uh, a, a, quote, doctrinal change in the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, and uh, it split, and there was a group of people called the Old Believers because they, they didn't change. You know, what the, you know what the issue was? Do you make the sign of the cross with three fingers or with two? There were literally tens of thousands of people of the Old Believers, what we'll call the Old Believers in Russia, tens of thousands of them put to death by the Tsar's troops because they continued to make the sign of the cross with two fingers rather than three. I mean, you, you know, you look at that and you sort of shake your heads and say, you know, what difference does it make? They were both wrong. Uh, you know, the issue was, should they have been making the sign of the cross at all? But you know, man's tendency is, is to be intolerant of even, uh, you know, human nature is to go to one extreme or the other. Either people want to be intolerant of the most minor deviation. Or they go to the other extreme of having just sort of this broad-minded tolerance. Anything goes. Neither represents God's way. We shouldn't have just an anything goes wide open toleration of sin. That's not God's way at all. But neither should we get into a frame of mind where we become so uh, quick to judge one another uh, in every little minor matter, and that barriers, that we allow barriers and tensions to build up among and between us. Because ultimately, brethren, I think we have to face the fact that there are issues that will not be completely, totally, permanently resolved until Jesus Christ returns. I, I don't think that, that we're going to... Uh, totally understand everything there is to understand until Christ comes back and we can ask Him directly. The issue is that none of us lives to Himself and none of us dies to Himself. You know, why do we judge our brother? Why do we set it not our brother? We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to have to give an account. You know, the worst reason to do something is because everybody else is doing it. I don't want to stand before Christ and give an account of something, he says, well, why were you, why, why did you start doing so-and-so? Well, everybody else started doing it, so I decided I would too. Now, that's not a reason to start, you know, that, that's an important thing to understand here on giving an account to God. 
you give an account because, you know, why do you live your life the way you do? Because everybody else does or because that's what God's Word says? You see, we need to, we need to focus in on our personal relationship with God, on the fact that ultimately we're accountable to God for what we do and we're trying to walk before God in humility and in love and in reverence for His Word. We're not standing in judgment of one another. Uh, we're, we don't have to give an account of, of ourselves to one another, but we do need to live our lives with an awareness that we're accountable to God for what we do. And what we need to judge is we need to judge this, that we're not putting a stumbling block in our brother's way. That we're not taking advantage of things that may cause others to stumble. We live in a world that is increasingly fractured and fragmented. Jesus Christ warned His church that that same sort of thing would eventually happen prior to and at the onset of the tribulation. There is a fundamental principle that is at the basis of maintaining and building unity in the church, and that has to do with the fact that ultimately our fellowship with one another is predicated upon our fellowship with God. We've got to be in harmony with God. We've got to walk with God in sincerity and in truth, in humility, that it is of a poor and contrite spirit and it trembles at my word. That's the sort of an attitude that puts us in a harmonious fellowship with God, that we live our lives seeking to live our lives on faith and, and growing in faith and drawing close to God, and that that's going to reflect itself in the concern and the care that we have for one another. Realizing our fellowship with one another goes beyond the superficial. It's predicated upon the fact that we're walking with God, we're seeking to serve Him and to be His people. And that therefore the love that flows from God through us out toward one another. We can build on that by seeking to be approachable, by trying to approach in a right way, and by recognizing the basis of spiritual fellowship. That this, our basis of our fellowship is spiritual. Talking about things, drawing close to one another. But you know, when we have a judging and condemning attitude, when we're quick to judge, we're going to erect barriers. And Satan will take advantage of those barriers and those tensions. The Apostle Paul warns us that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Brethren, if we're living in the last days, and I believe we are, and I think most of you do, if we're living in the last days, we're living in times the Bible says are perilous times, dangerous times. We need to draw close to God. We need to draw close to one another and to realize we're going to be under a continuing onslaught from Satan the devil to fracture and to fragment just as this entire world is doing and is disintegrating in the process. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. This world and this world system, Satan's society, will not stand. It is fractured and divided. The kingdom of God will stand forever. Brethren, let's do the things that we need to do to be a part of that kingdom. Now and forever.